Great. Tonight we're going to be talking about yet another aspect of the extremely rich history of Gravenhurst, the sanatorium age. First, a quick word about two words that you will see in here in this talk, sanitarium and sanatorium. A sanitarium had traditionally meant a sort of a health spa, a place where people went to take the waters, like Bath in England or Preston in Ontario. It meant a luxurious hotel with sulfur springs or other types of springs. Picture the Bamp Springs Hotel, for example, where people, usually the rich women of the family, of course, went to take the cure, meaning having a relaxing, pampered holiday. <clears throat> a sanatorium was distinguished by its emphasis on treatment of a disease or a condition, physical or mental. The National Sanitarium Association of Canada used the word sanatorium, but talked about the sanatoriums that they supported across Canada. It gets even more muddy when you talk about the plural, sanatoria versus sanatoriums. Sanatoriums is, apparently has become the go-to spelling. There's no better book than Curing Tuberculosis in Muskoka for understanding both the disease and the four sanatoria that addressed it in Muskoka. I've read it cover to cover three times and I always end up finding something that catches me in mid-stride to ponder. And without Candace Jones' map in that book, I would not even be able to tell you coherently where these four sanatoria were located in Gravenhurst. But there are all sorts of other documents and textbooks too that are invaluable if the subject interests you as much as it does me. And why does it interest me so much? Well, certainly the rise of the sanatorium age in Canada, and specifically in Gravenhurst, forms a huge milestone in our history. But on a deeper level, I have read most of what I could get my hands on because of my family, specifically my mother's family, who were devastated by the disease with my mother's life, and therefore mine, deeply affected by the relentless consumption of life that was tuberculosis. The talk is born out of my passion then for Gravenhurst history, but also born out of the nightmare that was my mother's childhood. For not only did she have to fight infantile paralysis or polio as a small child, but she also had to watch her mother and three sisters die at home, one by one by one, the um, other of tuberculosis. Thankfully, she survived along with her sister, Margaret. I must also apologize to those who are hoping to hear about the wonderful doctors who were so important to the sanatorium age in Gravenhurst. At least a dozen names come to mind, but there is so much to cover in this talk tonight that there, I could at least do three nights long. So I had to leave out references to, to most of those doctors. Okay. Being infected with tuberculosis did not necessarily mean that you might actually suffer from TB. My mother tested positive for tuberculosis all of her life because her mother and three sisters had died with it while she was living at home. And as they were too poor to be treated in a sanatorium, they suffered with it and died at home while she was a young girl. Both my mother and her sister survived without contracting the disease. As the population grew, so did the disease spread into the overcrowded cities and countries of Europe and North America, into the factories where people worked close by side, into the tenements where they lived, and even into the countryside where poverty meant inadequate good food and space. Even as late as into the 20th century, deaths from tuberculosis almost outpaced the deaths of soldiers in the Second World War. If you're as old as I am, you may remember spittoons in your grandfather's home. Everybody seemed to be spitting, and I always remember walking down city streets and wondering what on earth they were doing. Well, eventually they actually had to pass a law to prohibit spitting in public, but spitting was a lot of the cause of transmission of the disease. Both the discovery that tuberculosis is a bacterial disease and the rise of sanatoria to treat it all arose in Europe, and especially in Germany and then in Italy. It took a few decades before the movement spread in North America, first in Saranac, New York. <clears throat> but the results in sanatoria were spotty at first. A cure or at least an arrest of the disease might be possible with incipient cases, that is the new cases, um, but not with advanced cases and with only rest and fresh air as the prescribed factors. In Canada, it took about 10 more years for the sanatorium movement to appear. And it was William James Gage who brought it about with the rise of the sanatorium movement, finally in Canada. William Gage had become, has become a bit of a hero for me 
I hope that history does not reveal all sorts of murky secrets in his past, but right now what I can see is a man who rose from humble average roots with strong Methodist beliefs and hard work, successful enterprise, and giving back to society from that success. The list of charitable things that he and his wife accomplished in their lives is long, but here we can simply focus on his determination to do something about the number one disease killing people in Canada. And he cared about the fact that so many of these people were poor with inadequate housing, inadequate food, fresh air, so on. His determination to find a suitable site for the first sanatorium for TB took him across Canada with a search committee in tow, talking to mayors and councils and premiers across the country. And even when towns and cities said, no way, not in my backyard, he simply bore down harder to find the right place. The fact that he pulled in a number of other rich, influential men like Hart Massey uh, to his passion was all to the good. And his determination meant the beginning of treatment in Canada for tuberculosis sufferers. Gage brought together the right people at the right time to form the National Sanitarium Association of Canada in 1896. Having that national organization allowed him to raise money and control how it was spent. His lifelong involvement in education meant that teaching people how to live with tuberculosis was important to him. He also made sure that every contribution was applied directly to the funding of sanatoria with no kickbacks for the donors. Even though the Toronto Board of Trade and the Toronto City Council had been in favor of a sanatorium in or near Toronto, and even though Gage had pledged $25,000 towards building it, along with another $25,000 from Hart Massey, when it was decision time, the 1895 board, um, sorry, the 1895 Toronto City Council rejected the proposal, probably because they received enough negative feedback from citizens that they were frightened of the result should they support the idea of a building of a sanatorium in Toronto. Kamloops tried to win a bidding war to get the sanatorium there, but in the end, it was Gravenhurst Mayor Charles Mickle and Council who offered the best incentives to get the sanatorium here. And they were aided by the fact that for decades, Muskoka had been known as the health giving location to go to with allergies or poor health. Many resorts were seen as sanitaria here where the water in the lakes and the streams was sparkling, the air clean and pure, the pines providing heavenly, heavenly scent of good health in the making. In fact, the Toronto Globe captured it well in 1897 with this description. Charles Mickle and his council provided all the right incentives to lure Gage and his team to Gravenhurst. In fact, he offered them a free site of substantial acreage and he gave different various numbers to that acreage depending on what they wanted on the edge of town with exemption from taxes. They would build a smooth road from the station to the site and they would give $10,000, which is a substantial amount of money toward the building of the sanitarium. There were certainly reasons for citizens to think twice about this venture, but far from fearing the idea, the citizens of Gravenhurst actually embraced it as the voting tally shows. 191 in favor, five against. The voting, voting numbers seem very low to our eyes today, but remember who could and who could not vote in those days. There were no women voters. Only property owners could vote as well. The population of Gravenhurst may have been close to 2000 people at the time, but half of those would be women, another quarter would be children, and many were away in the bush as loggers or working in mills and not available to vote, while others did not own property, but rather rented. This is the first version that I've created from the map that Candace Jones drew for their book. It gives you a quick location for the property chosen for the first sanatorium in Canada, the Muskoka Cottage Sanatorium. It's located at the top of a long point out into Lake Muskoka at the very end of Muskoka Road, the main street of Gravenhurst, known to locals as the Sand Road. <clears throat> to help you further with the location in case you still can't quite picture it, I've added the information about what the sanatorium, sanatorium sorry, went on to become in the future beyond this talk. Charles Mickle and his council provided all the right incentives to lure Gage and his team to Gravenhurst. Decisions had to be made though as to who would qualify to receive sanatorium treatment and who would not. 
Initially, it would be people in the early stages or incipient stages of tuberculosis who might have a fighting chance of survival. And it would be people who could afford to pay at least part of the cost of their stay in the Seine. They would pay $6 a week. Province would pay $2 that they usually provided for hospital support for a total of $8 a week. That sum of $8 would certainly not cover the actual cost of a sanatorium stay. The 13th of July, 1897, marked the beginning of the sanatorium age in Canada when Muskoka Cottage Sanatorium was officially open to patients, the first in Canada and the second in North America. The Globe on the 23rd of August, 1897, declared the Gravenhurst Sanatorium the finest edifice for the treatment of consumption in North America. Talk about elegant. This building was painted a creamy yellow with a roof that really highlighted the look. A tower, rounded ends with a broad veranda running the full length of the building, columns at the portico. How much more elegant could it really look than this? 35 patients were initially uh, admitted to that hospital, but only incipient cases. That smooth road that had been promised was one of the two ways of accessing the sanatorium, the other being by steamer from Muskoka Wharf. Of course, it's all very well to show patients arriving, but remember the countless patients turned away. Despite the fact in all the literature sent out to doctors and newspapers, it was very clearly spelled out that patients must be in the incipient or early stages or they would not be admitted. Dozens of people still made the journey, hoping that being on the spot, they would be admitted. They were not. In the sanatorium, there were telephones, electricity, a music room, a library, a reading room, dining room, spacious halls, three solaria, and paths kept clear for walking once patients had reached the stage where they could actually take mild exercise. And the whole property was filled with woods, beech, maple, balsams, all along um, the property with white pine and spruce. Meals were served at 8 a.m., 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. Lunches were served at 11 a.m., 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. and you were expected to eat all your food. Eight to 13 hours were spent on verandas and bedtime was 10 o'clock at night. This was a hospital, remember. Three cottages had also been built and endowed by the time of the opening or at least shortly thereafter. These were located in close proximity to the main building, as you will see in a minute. The cottages housed about four patients in each. They were modeled on the luxurious and picturesque cottages found in both Muskoka and on the Eastern seaboard of the United States. They were expensive to build separately, but could be endowed by someone, thereby cutting the cost to zero. Each had a large sitting room with an open fireplace. There was a belief that patients would do better housed in small groups. Each patient had his own room, though several two patient rooms existed for those who requested them. Turrets and rounded corners on some gave that continuity with the main building. Wraparound porches on each cottage encouraged patients to spend their days in the open air rather than in their rooms. Tents and tent shacks and then tent cottages were in use almost from the beginning. Initially, the tent was simply that, but with the new name of tent shack came an improved model. They were taken off the ground they had canvas walls, wooden floors, pitched wooden shingled roofs that had wood burning stoves as well. Each tent shack was divided to hold two patients with the front open to the weather. Patients were bundled under blankets and furs to keep warm, but often woke to find themselves covered in snow with their beds surrounded by snow right up to the mattress level. Like all the buildings, they were built facing the lake. Even the patients housed in the main building spent their time on the wide verandas for eight to 13 hours per day. This was not a spa, this was a hospital designed to treat and cure or at least improve the condition of its patients. These cottages were added in the never attempting to keep pace with the growing waiting lists and demands for accommodation and people paying a daily rate expected comfort, good food and lovely surroundings. The staff had long walks from the main building to cottage by cottage by cottage to provide constant medical care. In 1898, a system of bells had been installed so that caregivers could be reached when needed. <clears throat> in 1904, the Muskoka Cottage Sanatorium added a school of nursing to 
to attract staff nurses who would take theoretical courses in classes, but do their practical work in the sanatorium itself. But William Gage was deeply concerned about poor tubercular patients who could not afford to pay for this kind of care. The Free Hospital for Consumptives opened on July the 5th, 1902. This was the first free hospital for consumptives in the world. The Free Hospital for Consumptives was necessarily built to a more economical scale, whereas the Cottage Sanatorium had cost $60,000 to build, this free hospital cost 20 to build with Gage contributing 10,000 and Massey the other 10,000. Patients were housed in wards of eight beds, one ward of five beds and a ward of four beds, totaling 41 patients to start. Donations paid for the furnishings, railways supplied free transportation to Gravenhurst. Dr. Charles Parfit was named the physician in charge, a former medalist in, mem in medicine at the U of T with experience at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Dr. Parfit himself though would fight a continuing battle with tuberculosis. Again, patients at the free hospital had to be in the incipient stages of TB, but at least they didn't have to pay. With apologies to Candace Jones once more, I again have used her map with Andrew Baston's permission, of course, to show the location of the New Muskoka Free Hospital for consumptives, about one and a half kilometers closer to town, also on the Muskoka Road or the Sand Road. If you're rooting around in your mind for a reference point, think the Canister Subdivision or the Ontario Fire College. Again, this sanatorium was located on what would ultimately be about 100 acres of land on Lake Muskoka. Even in 1902, the year it opened, the free hospital could not begin to cope with the overwhelming demand for patients. Four tent shacks were quickly built, each accommodating four more patients, and a pavilion was added with 12 beds to increase the number of patients to 78. The free hospital had a reception room, physician's offices, a dispensary, a laboratory, hospital staff quarters with added ice house and steam laundry outside to handle all the laundry from both the cottage and the free hospital. By 1906, another tent shack had added four more patients. But right from the start, the free hospital would be in a constant financial battle. The cost of food, fuel, medicine, and staff <clears throat> had to come from donations rather than from patients. The free hospital began the endowment of beds, $300 to endow a bed for one year. These photographs show the original free hospital building with a new administration building beside it. The two were joined together by a glassed in bridge. The administration building also had verandas and the original building became a residence for patients. The free hospital now had 140 beds available and lucky it was since the Toronto Free Hospital for the Consumptive Poor was destroyed by fire in 1910. New fundraising campaigns were begun named in honor of the recently deceased King Edward VII. With these funds, two new institutions were ultimately built the Toronto Free Hospital, and the Queen Mary Hospital for Tubercular Children. Gage had donated 10,000, sorry, 110,000 to the fund, 10,000 to train doctors, and $100,000 to build a new National Sanatorium Association headquarters called the Gage Institute with a dispensary and x-ray equipment. Charles Massey had donated 10,000, and that money would be used to fund something particularly spectacular, which we'll show you in a moment. Branch, branch associations of the National Sanitarium Association were able to raise funds in their own areas to endow beds and to provide for the patients who were their own citizens. In 1907, Fulford Cottage was built, again to try to increase the available space at the hospital. By 1905, Dr. Parfit had become seriously ill and Dr. Walter Bingham Kendall took over and would lead the two sanatoria for the next 30 years. The free hospital would not be building luxurious cottages to be endowed by rich philanthropists or municipalities. An individual or a company or a municipality could endure and endow a bed for one year at a cost of $300. It quickly became apparent that the people in charge of the finances at the free hospital were very good at thinking outside the box. So first came the endowment of beds and then came the forerunner of occupational therapy. Patients who were deemed well enough to do some tasks, a way of combating their boredom and increasing their skills, were fitted into an appropriate category 
and allowed to work at a specified task for a specified amount of time. And speaking of more than one way to fund a sanatorium, what's that about a farm? This photograph was published in the annual report of 1913-1914 of the National Sanatorium Association. It shows the major buildings of the free hospital for consumptives and also shows part of the farm that was established in the beginning in 1906. <clears throat> in 1906, 300 birds were purchased for the Henry, producing 2,083 eggs for that year. By 1912, there were 700 birds, so you can do the math on that one. In 1915, an extra 1,000 birds were added to boost production. In addition, the Free Hospital purchased 66 acres of land in 1913, and in 1914, two cement piggeries were added. The vegetable garden was large enough to produce almost all of the vegetables needed for the free hospital patients. An infirmary was added to the free hospital in 1916 to take advanced cases. And here's what Chester Massey built with that $10,000. It was Massey Hall. This photograph was taken in 1915 and shows either a patient or possibly a staff member walking past what might very well be one of the most beautiful heritage buildings in Muskoka. Although Massey had imagined the building being used as a center of worship, in fact, it had many more uses as well. A place for lectures, a place for social events, including town social events like dances, and with a projection booth and a screen, it became a place to show first run silent movies provided free from the theater companies. Just a further quick look at this beautiful building with its floor to ceiling windows that open right up a stage and proscenium arch, and added at about 2005, the stylistically sympathetic steel supports to hold snow load. Truly one of a kind and crafted by local stone masons, carpenters and contractors in 1913. This is a building to preserve. In 1916, yet another large building had been added, seen to the left beside the admin building. It too was joined by a glass walkway to the other buildings. This new infirmary would hold many more patients. We'll go down the road now to a, another set of sanatoriums and see, or sorry, back to the cottage sanatorium to see what had been happening there. The Kendall Pavilion opened in June of 1913 with beds for 20 patients. Each patient had an open air sleeping room, a dressing room, and there were lavatories with toilets and running hot and cold water. A spacious veranda faced south across the whole pavilion. Many, many more pavilions would be built at both sanatoria. Here's a close-up look at that Kendall Pavilion with its main building in the center of it. And this is the very famous often seen photograph of the interior of the pavilion with windows open, some of them right up to the ceiling as you can see where they're anchored there and Christmas decorations hanging above the beds. Now we'll move closer to Gravenhurst in a view of a new set of sanatoria. Dr. Parfit had always dreamed of building a sanatorium for the well-to-do, and he saw his chance to do, to do so. This map, stolen from Candace and Andrea again, shows you two additional sanatoria located within town limits. The dot for the Minnewaska Hotel, which would become the Minnewaska Sanatorium, is shown at the foot of Fraser Street. The dot for the Canada... Calador Sanatorium is shown at the foot of Lawrence Street. Those two um, names in the yellow box should probably be swapped around. We will talk about these two institutions next before returning to the original ones that you've already explored. The Minnewaska Hotel was built by Frank Hurlbut in 1897. It was a small, luxurious first-class hotel with wealthy Torontonians in mind. It had a ballroom, lovely lawns down to the water and covered porches, large trees for shady enjoyment of Muskoka's fresh, invigorating air. But it was hard for a small hotel like his to compete with the lake, likes of the Royal Muskoka and other large and flashier hotels on the lakes. And Hurlbut sold his hotel to people who would turn it into a sanatorium for those who could pay for their treatment. The Minnewaska Sanatorium was converted in 1909 to hold 25 tubercular patients. This sanatorium was completely full within six weeks of its opening, but the building was old and the funding was limited, and it did not fit the plan that Dr. Parfit had devised to build the finest first-class sanatorium in Canada. 
Patients would be able to pay for first class surroundings and treatment in his planned sanatorium. Dr. Parfit applied for permission to build such an institution in 1913 and the town of Gravenhurst had no objection. This is another view of the Menawaska, which continued to operate as a sanatorium until it was torn down in approximately 1919. Parfit's timing was both problematic and fortuitous. A war had begun in 1914 and funding to build anything was immediately diverted to the war effort in building war material. But in 1915, Dr. Parfit with some business partners, partners managed to put together a company and the funding to build the dream sanatorium he had always envisioned, the Calador. The Calador was another beautiful sanatorium designed to provide luxurious surroundings and the best of care for people who could afford to pay for such an institution. It uh, was a gray building with a pink roof. <laughs> As Dr. Parfit had indicated, he had built this sanatorium for a quote unquote, better class of patients. The Calador like the cottage sanatorium building was designed by a Toronto architectural firm. The list of attributes was lengthy. The staff highly trained and all levels of, of tuberculosis conditions were accepted because of course people were paying. The result was a quickly lengthening waiting list. But this sanatorium had been open just as hundreds of Canadian soldiers were being shipped home from the war front, not only with serious wounds, but with diseases of the lungs contracted during the war. Trench lung, tuberculosis were easily passed on in the crowded foul conditions of the trenches. Poison gas attacks had left many young soldiers with permanently damaged lungs. The Calador would be taking its share. As sanatoria made room for a flood of soldiers, they also faced the usual fallout that comes from wars, rising prices and diminishing staffs. These photographs capture just some of the soldiers with lung disease who were at least a bit more mobile and could have their pictures taken. You have to love the military issue house coats in the photograph at the top left. We would call them distinctive at the very least. Soldiers who had been overseas and had seen what they had seen were not easily controlled. From time to time, several would make their way into town to visit the local hotels. Local hotels were fined for serving these men. Almost all Canadian soldiers would be back home in Canada by June of 1919. I know we like to think that the war ended in November of 1918, but the actual um, return of the soldiers took place throughout the coming seven or eight months. Those who had been sent to sanatoria in Gravenhurst began to leave for sanatoria that were being built closer to their homes, or they simply discharged themselves to go to work or because they believed that they were cured. And of course, many of them uh, returned uh, because they re, uh, caught tuberculosis. Wooden buildings were always vulnerable to fire. So a fire is in fact what occurred in November of 1920 at the Free Hospital for Consumptives. Quick thinking by sanatorium staff and a quick response by Gravenhurst Fire Department kept the fire from spreading. At the end of the day, most of the new infirmary and most of the administration building had been lost to fire. All the patients were saved and some were taken to Massey Hall, which became a ward for a while. Patients were taken to the Toronto Sanatorium in the coming days and weeks as well. And many others were housed in the Cottage Sanatorium in Gravenhurst. The fire devastated Sir William Gage to such a degree that he suffered a stroke and died shortly thereafter. The Free Hospital would carry on as an administrative center with offices and accommodations for doctors, nurses, and a few patients. The farm, farm, of course, would be too valuable to let go and would be continued well into the future. Since the cottage sanatorium had been enlarged, Massey Hall would once again become a center of recreation and lectures rather than a ward. A huge fundraising campaign was begun to rebuild following the fire. Money poured in from the province, the city of Toronto, and communities like Barrie, Aurelia, Midland, Perry Sound, the town of Gravenhurst gave $3,000 and the citizens had to vote on those debentures to raise that money. But the decision was made not to rebuild at the free hospital site and instead the new building would be built at the cottage sanatorium. 
by the way, you might have noticed the omission of a town name that you might have thought would be there in the list of those giving uh, to that rebuilding fund. In actual fact, that town did not contribute. The gauge cornerstone was laid in 1922 and the hospital was opened in July of 1923. Architect Charles Cobb from Toronto assured the NSA that the new brick building was fireproof and would be a model of efficiency with a new centralized plant for heating and lighting. Although there would be no balconies or porches, the flat roof would become the area where patients took their fresh air. There were 32 wards on three floors of the west wing and four floors of the east wing. And you can see why in that picture, because uh, the West Wing had only three floors and the East Wing had four floors. And that had to do with all of the rock and granite in, in Muskoka. About 95% of the patients required absolute bed rest. A separate building would house the kitchen and three dining rooms reached by an underground tunnel, a dining room for the cottage sand patients, one for the uh, Muskoka cottage, or sorry, for the Muskoka free hospital, for the Muskoka hospital patients and one for the uh, sanatorium staff. In 1925, four lodge buildings were added in matching brick with 16 patients in each to replace the worn out pavilions. An infirmary was built to accommodate 26 more with advanced tuberculosis. A new nurses home for 15 nurses was added to the complex. With all the construction jobs created, it's no wonder that the banner saw that the sanitaria will be in the future as they have been in the past, the main basis of the town's prosperity. By 1928, more than half the patients were staying at least six months with much improved results. Surgery accounted for much of that improvement. Pneumothorax surgery, which had begun in 1914, was very successful for the 71% of patients who could take it and usually resulted in cured, arrested, or at least improved conditions. New surgery techniques like thoracoplasty removed some of the ribs on the diseased side of the chest to allow the chest to collapse. Although doctors were pleased with the results of these surgeries, the 1929 stats for a four-year period still showed two-thirds improved, one-third unimproved, and who would die. In 1923, the province asked Dr. Kendall to establish chest clinics bi-weekly, which he did in Barrie, Aurelia, and Collingwood. In 1928, Muskoka Hospital established its own outpatient clinic. An exciting addition to the Muskoka Hospital was a radio system donated by Canadian General Electric, eventually providing radio broadcast to every building on the property with 24 miles of wiring and 1,000 pairs of headphones. Everything from patient DJs playing requests for, for music to a play-by-play -play broadcast of hockey games from the local arena. Uh, done by a doctor, by the way, kept patients thoroughly entertained. And in those days, Gravenhurst hockey teams were winning everything. So the hockey was pretty exciting. With the depression, more changes, however, would come and not for the better. Wealthy families who lost everything in the crash would no longer be able to afford places like the Calador or even the cottage sanatorium. And by 1933, the Calador had lost a third of its patients. By 1935, it was forced to close and was sold by Dr. Parfit to Board Lack Investments in 1937. The Cottage Santa Muskoka Hospital merged around 1940 to be one hospital. As donations declined, some municipalities even tried to shirk paying for their indigent patients who were housed in the um, sanatoriums in Gravenhurst, but they were forced to pay because the law said they had to. In 1932, a new north wing was added to the Gage building with five stories and 100 additional beds on the top four floors. On the first floor, a new surgical unit with labs, x-ray unit, dispensary, and so on, meant that by 1937, the surgical team had been able to complete 200 surgeries in just a year or two. By 1939, the nursing staff had grown to a superintendent of nurses, five assistants, four operating room nurses, and 48 ward nurses. In 1938, a new set of, of labs opened in a separate two-story brick building, one for bacteriology, one for pathology, along with another lab for research. A morgue and an autopsy, autopsy suite um, concluded the um, uh, occupancy of that new building. In 1934, two parts of Muskoka Hospital had been formalized, a school and an occupational therapy department. 
World War II would add more issues. All soldiers would be tested for TB before being enlisted. Those found infected would be sent to sanatoria. Norwegian pilots and German POWs, also in Gravenhurst, also received medical testing and surgery at the hospital from time to time. And imagine jockeying those two groups around. It was the advent of antibiotics that truly began to win the war against tuberculosis. Streptomycin, along with two other drugs, became the first in a series of breakthrough medical treatments for TB. The rate of improvement wrote, rose from the typical 66% to a staggering 90% by the mid-1950s. The sanatorium age was reaching its climax. What then happened to these incredible facilities? In 1957, Farm Marshal W.J. Scott finally saw his dream come to fruition. The free hospital property was purchased by uh, the Ontario government to create an Ontario Fire College for the training of fire officers, the first residential fire college in Canada and the second in North America. This college would be closed on March 31st, 2023 by the present Ontario government, following a complete refurbishment of the 100 bed residents. Most if not all of the new beds had never even been slept in when it was closed. Why Muskoka Hospital did not become the general hospital for South Muskoka is a question best answered by the politicians of that day. Instead, in 1960, the Ontario government purchased the Muskoka Hospital property from the National Sanitarium Association to open a residential school for the mentally challenged with some 300 clients and about the same number of staff. It too would be closed by the Ontario government along with all other regional centers in Ontario in the early 1990s as people who were developmentally delayed were deinstitutionalized and moved into the community. The aerial photograph that you see here from the Muskoka District Geohub site shows you the extent of the Cottage Sanatorium Center property. The description comes from the Ontario government site that advertises government properties for sale. The Ontario government has sole decision-making powers in this matter and the countless delegations from Gravenhurst have made no real impact at all. All the buildings have been left to decay to total ruin on this property. What is left in good condition because it's been refurbished, although apparently it does need repainting, is the gazebo or joss house on the shore of Lake Muskoka. It's protected by a Gravenhurst bylaw, which probably means very little in the provincial scheme of things. This photograph, again from the GeoHub site, shows the extent of the fire college property or the uh, free hospital property. Uh, there was no mention made on the site uh, that advertises properties for sale of the actual um, lakefront footage. But in fact, this is a 100 um, acre property. It has 27 buildings on it. All of them were in good condition when the property was closed in 1921. Today, if you're to drive to the gates of either the Free Hospital or of the Muskoka Cottage Sanatorium, this is what you will be confronted by. Two signs telling you that you will not be able to enter the property and no one does, no one can. Um, and in fact, what you're looking at then is the potential disintegration of buildings on both the Fire College site and as well uh, the total disintegration that has taken place on the Muskoka Cottage Sanatorium property. A report that came from the World Health Organization showed just how extensive tuberculosis still is in the world with a 1.5 million um, chance of, of people dying across, across, across the globe. That was in 2015. The, the numbers have gone up and down with the pandemic that intervened and so on, so that at times the numbers are higher and at times they're lower, just depending upon what universal disease is out there. Tuberculosis is still a very real thing. Any questions? <laughs> okay.